grade, my dance teacher was killed in a car accident. And they hired a new dance teacher to come in and teach us. And he was mean. <laughs> really, really mean. Um, so he called us back. And he would show us this step, but not break it down. You know, like when you're learning something, you have to have it really slow and in really small portions. Um, especially for some of us that are left and right challenged. Because we learn it by what we've seen, not necessarily by you telling me go left. I have to know what that left means, right? It was hard and uncomfortable. And yet he was so mean. And she was so nice. My teacher who had died. She was wonderful and kind and compassionate. And she loved us. And he was so mean. So I practiced that tap dance like you wouldn't believe. Like they must have been so annoyed with me in the parsonage, my family. Because I made sure that I could do every step to perfection. And he never said a word. We were unsure of ourselves for a whole variety of reasons. When you're in fifth and sixth grade, you are feeling very unsure of yourself because your body is doing things that you just don't understand, right? And it's in an awkward phase where some of you are towering over all the boys in your class because you've reached your full height, and some of you are tiny because you haven't grown yet. It's just an uncomfortable age. And when someone comes in and says to you, you're ugly, you're too fat, it crushes your spirit. But my spirit, always being slightly rebellious, said, I'm going to prove him wrong. And then promptly after the recital, quit. And never went back to dance class ever again. <laughs> but we were struggling and unsure. All of us in that class, that very first day we went back, cried and cried and cried because we had lost somebody special to us. Because we were in pain over what had happened and unsure of where we were going and what we would do. And then we got him. <laughs> The disciples are in that spot, not the whole in fifth, sixth grade and feeling uncomfortable with their bodies, but they're unsure of who they are and what they're to do. So the first part of our story is the road to Emmaus, right? In that story, two of the disciples, one that we have never heard of, which means that there were way more than 12, right? So one we had never heard of and a friend are walking down the road, heading away from Jerusalem to their home. And on the way, they start talking to a fellow traveler on the road. Because the more people you have together, the safer you're going to be. Whether it's from bandits that are out there, whether it's from soldiers who are unkind, whether it's from the fact that you may need a drink of water. Having another person there is a helpful means of getting to your destination. And while they're walking and this stranger is with them, they start talking about all the events that had happened. Everything that had occurred in Jerusalem and the death of Jesus. And the stranger starts talking to them about scripture. Starts talking to them about fulfilling the scripture. About feeling in what it meant to experience the presence of God in their life. And during all that conversation, they never knew it was Jesus. Never experienced Jesus. They experienced a tingling, it says, a feeling. But they didn't experience 
he's like, and then when they finally get to their stopping place, they sit down to have a meal. And it's only when Jesus breaks the bread that they recognize who is in their midst. It's in the breaking open of the loaf of bread that they experience the presence of Jesus. And then Jesus disappears. And they, because of this experience, where they had been fleeing danger, right? Heading out of Jerusalem, turn around and head back. Back into Jerusalem, back to the locked room, behind the locked door. They're back in that locked room behind the locked door, and they're telling the disciples, the rest of the gathered there in that room, that Jesus was present with us, that the holy, the mystery of the world was in our midst, was talking to about us about what happened. The holy was with us and ate with us. The holy was in our presence and shared a meal. And then Jesus appeared. It doesn't matter that the door is locked. Jesus appears. And said, the words we heard last week, peace be with you. Jesus gives them that first step to make themselves sure. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And it says, they were filled with fear and doubt. They were filled with fear and doubts. They didn't know what was happening. They were having trouble with the holy being present in their midst. So they were filled with fear and doubt. So Jesus says, come on, look, can you see? Can you see the scars on me? Do you want to touch them? But here's an interesting quirk of the tale. It never says they touched it never says that they took him up on the offer of touching the holy. Instead, it says, while in their joy, they were disbelieving and wondering. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and wondering. And then Jesus, because food is the thing, he asks them for some fish to eat and sits down and eats. That Jesus sees their fear and doubt, sees their wondering and disbelieving, and he shows them the next step in our dance. He shows them the next step to take. He shows them that when they eat together, when they gather together and eat, that the holy will be present, that the holy will be with them, that the holy will surround them and it fills them. I want us to think about that phrase. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and wondering. While in their joy, disbelief and wonder. We don't normally put all those together, right? We may put joy and wonder together. Because when you were exploring something new, when you were seeing the first steps of a child walking, because I know a lot of you have new great grandbabies, when you see those first steps, you are filled with joy and wonder, right? But are you filled at the same time with disbelief? And that's why it's an interesting sentence, right? That they had joy, disbelief, and wonder. And I think that's an important part of our faith journey. That one of the things that makes us, the United Church, 
Church of Christ, a wonderful place to live and experience your faith, is that we don't say you have to get rid of your disbelief. We don't say you have to overcome your doubts. We say, ask us your questions. Share with us what's going on, and we will talk to you about our own questions, our own concerns, our own doubts and fears. Come to us and we will talk. Or maybe we will just give you a cup of coffee and a cookie. Because sometimes all you need to do is eat together. <laughs> instead of try to solve the problem. But this idea, this idea of joy and wonder and disbelief, It's a powerful image that stuck with me this week. Because the disciples encountered Jesus, encountered the holy, and yet there was a mystery, right? There wasn't surety and certainty. There wasn't complete understanding. There wasn't the triumph of knowing everything. There was a tingling. There was a sense of hope and joy and mystery and wonder. And then there was a sense of deep doubt and question. A sense of disbelief that this has all happened, that this is happening, that God is there. They experienced the holy. They felt the presence of the holy in sharing and eating together. But they had questions. They wondered about what it meant, how it could be, what that meant for their lives. Because think about this. Why would you head out of Jerusalem at that point? You've heard the stories from Acts. You saw what happened on Jesus' journey and went through Jerusalem. You saw that questioning the structures of power led to his execution and death by the Savior. You saw that. And now you know that they are looking for you. That you know that you won't be safe. That if you continue on the path with the holy, the mystery, that all that is, all that could be, that you are putting yourself in danger. So what do you do? The disciples are locked in that room. But we, don't, we know they don't stay there. In Luke, after Jesus leaves for the final time, the Spirit comes on them, and they set out into the world to share the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. To share the story of a God that loves us so powerfully. A God that loves us and comes to us in the very ordinary things of life. In the healing of a wound, in the eating of bread, in the drinking of wine, in the sharing of a meal of fish. The Jesus that comes to us in the ordinary, everyday parts of our life and in the places where we're hurting. They share that story. They share a love that asks you to cross boundaries, to cross ethnicities, to cross state rules. They share a love that encompasses everyone and everything. And we know what happens, right? If you read through Acts, they are arrested, they are jailed, they are executed. So they have a right to their uncertainty, their doubts, and their fears. They have a right to those questions and troubles that are in their soul. And yet they still have joy and wonder. They still want to encounter the holy and show you how to encounter the holy. They want to share the hope and promises of love that is beyond all. 
a love that takes you outside of yourself. And here's one of the things I was thinking about as I have read and sit with the scripture. Is that when we're in that midst of doubt, when we're in that midst of disbelief, one of the things, one of the powerful things that helps us to experience joy and wonder is to share a meal. To share food with another. To cook for those who are closest to you. To pack bags that will feed kids. To hand out boxes of food to people who need them. Those acts, those acts of compassion and love help us draw us closer, help us to realize that we don't have to be stuck in our doubts and disbelief. We don't have to be stuck in our rebellion. We can experience the joy and wonder 